I think we'll start at a very basic sort of introductory sort of level. Um, who are you and what does the News Media Alliance do? I think you have a really interesting background that sort of relates to the broad space that you all cover. Yeah, great. Thank you. And and thank you for uh, having me today. The, and the conversations have been actually great so far. Um, yeah, so News Media Alliance, we represent the news publishing industry, 2,000 or so news publishers, mostly in the U.S., some in Europe as well. And I often describe myself as a pugilist for the news business. I'm here to uh, both represent it and uh, and fight for its future. Um, and to uh, uh, and that involves yes, that involves lobbying, communications, but also telling the story of the industry, and also uh, you know making the arguments for what the industry needs to grow and succeed into the future. Which actually, I think it will. Actually, yeah. So I don't like introducing people because you just said three interesting things that I want to get into. Dude, so thank you for, nobody else wants you to either. So yeah. Thank interesting. you. Thank you for validating the, the underlying theory here. So um, point number one, so what is the story of the industry? It's November sort of 2020. Like what is the narrative you sort of have in your head and your sort of members sort of have themselves to? Yeah, I mean, you start with the fact that we have bigger, more engaged audiences than we have ever had in history, period. You know, <laughs> if you go back to peak print era, whatever that was, it, actually peak print, interesting, was 2006, right? That was the peak of that, whatever that era was called. Uh, we have many, many, many times more readers and consumers of our content uh, than than that time period and really than ever. And I think in many fundamental ways, news content is more centered in people's dialogue and and uh, you know how they go about their day uh, is really engaged. They're engaged with news content in an ongoing way in in ways that frankly, like my parents wouldn't have been. So, yeah. and I think that's shown that shows itself at a lot of different times. But in election season, how much of our time the last week has been spent consuming news content? A lot. So uh, you know so. Fundamentally, we do not have an audience problem. This is a a kind of uh, you know journalism is something that people want and need and consume uh, more than they ever have. We have business model challenges, uh, but also I think those business model challenges are all are solvable, and we can get into that. Uh, there are you know, we're moments of inflection, and we, there will be a different future than the past. I also think just from your conversations today, a, a clear message has to be that we're in sort of mid bounce in terms of technology. You know, there's going to be further evolution of how people consume news uh, in ways that I think will keep getting better. So uh, people want our stuff. The finances are really hard and really challenged. Uh, but the fact that people want our stuff is the pathway to get to a more stable financial future. So how do you think about, so to, the, to speaking of this idea of more engaged audiences than ever, how much do you think that was a 2016 to 2020 Trump phenomenon that organizations at different levels of scale are going to have to sort of struggle with, aka a Biden presidency is one where news won't be a sort of reality TV show that everyone's sort of tuning in for the latest episode. Do you, is that a dynamic that y'all sort of like consider or sort of think about? Yeah, I think that that gets overplayed to a large degree. Yeah, that that macro point about people consuming news content was that pre-existing Trump's run mm -hmm. for the for for the White House. It really comes about because people can consume it much more easily, right? You, it's very, it's very easy to consume um, uh, news, and and people want to. Trump has certainly uh, driven attention uh, to himself in, in pretty fundamental ways. I don't think, I don't think all of a sudden we segue back to some uh, other period where people don't pay attention to national political stories anymore. And also, Trump really didn't impact people's consumption of local ever, right? Mm -hmm. So think about this moment we're in now. Is, are you going to stop uh, consuming content about COVID in your community or uh, what's happening with the, the economy and local restaurants? So, you know, well, could there be some variances in audiences? Yes. But, uh, you know, the macro trends are all that people like to consume journalism. 
So this is helpful. Let's delineate then between consumption and attention and sort of payment. So I completely agree there's a world where, and I not just hypothetically, I agree with your point about consumption will remain. But what about sort of payment? Because sort of the conventional understanding of the business pivot that many publishers have done at the bigger level and that local publishers have really struggled with is the sort of pay to subscribe, membership, subscription, support our mission, paywalls, et cetera. There's an argument to me that that was a Trump era phenomenon, right? If you're looking at the top level of the Washington Post, that's democracy dies in darkness. With the New York Times, this is what we were talking about with the last panel, support our journalism so that we could get Trump's taxes or we can send foreign correspondents to China. So do you think the willingness to pay, so we could stipulate attention will remain, but do you think willingness to pay at all levels will shift um, given this sort of trend? Because the one thing I'll add too on this is that the New York Times' stock did sort of tank. So at least the market or the stock market does believe, I'm not trying to you know give it sort of autonomy, but there is a perception that this moment will not be good for the health of that business model. Uh, I, first of all, we're seeing growth of subscription at all levels, including mm -hmm. local publishers, right? Uh, and that's that's harder to do. And we can get into why that's harder to do. But that's that's been a harder strategy for them, but you're seeing kind of consistent increases in reader support across the board. And again, a lot of that is not uh, Trump related. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, my phone was going off there. <laughs> the, it's okay. The dilemmas <laughs> of Zoom. Um, <laughs> and, you know the uh, and again, I I think we're uh, we're in this. Um, we're in this moment where there's a lot of things that people are interested in and focused on where, you know, do I think that there's some vast shift in uh, reader support because Trump moves on to do whatever he goes on to do next? I mean, I just don't see it. I think it makes a nice storyline, but I don't, and will there be some variability? Could be, but I don't think it changes fundamentals. And we certainly don't want to build a business based on, uh, you know, some transient uh, personalities, uh, per media personality. When I when I talk about monetization of news or the business model, we have to understand something very fundamental, which is we are at a historic moment where essentially we're rethinking and renegotiating the terms of trade for this kind of content. And what the analogy I always make is back to the music business, you know, 120 years ago, music was a print business. It, it was a sheet music business sold mostly to orchestras. And they had a disruption in their distribution, most particularly recording devices came about and then radio and TV and other things. And they had to figure out this whole system of music licensing was their answer that then carried them through other distributions such that today, Music publishers are the net winners of music distribution online. So the music business, because it had a system for distribu uh, distributed monetization of the content, they were able to carry through. Uh, TV, a different model, local TV with retransmission and, and cable. So we're in this moment where we our distribution has been disrupted. We have these new distribution channels and we're going to, we A, need to figure out how the value gets returned back through those channels. And I'm sort of known for complaining about Google and Facebook, which I'm always happy to do and I'm happy to do here. It's coming, but, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but understand, those companies pay to license music. Yeah, they pay. So why do they do that? They do that because they have to, because there was a system developed about 100 years ago. So one, we got to fix the digital distribution, uh, that digital ecosystem for news. Um, reader revenue is going to continue to be really important and expanding. Um, the, there's other kind of related businesses related to events and, uh, and other things. And I think there's also going to be technical uh, evolutions in terms of our product offerings over time. One of the things, and then people talk about philanthropy and government and other stuff, which I'm also happy to talk about. One thing I always caution folks about is not to focus too much on one revenue stream, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, we were a heavily advertising subsidized business. 
we're now going to be multiple revenue streams, all of which have their challenges and, and opportunities. But I'll stop there. I'm happy to take that in any way. You'd no, like. no, of course. Um, yeah, a couple a couple notes here. So I like the historic moment analogy to a century ago. So the immediate question would be, where are we in that metaphor, right? Because you start with sheet music, but then if you look at the music industry, you have 80 plus years of really high, like highs in the 70s and 80s, and you have some lows of sort of Napster. Where do you sort of think, you know, and sort of figuring out how do we do iTunes? How do we sort of license music to platforms like Google and Spotify, et cetera? So where do you think, are we, are we in the sheet music moment where it just literally this thing has happened and we just don't quite know the exact nature of the bargain that's going to get struck? Yeah, I mean, we're in the early, early innings of it. Um, again, take music licensing. That took about 25 years to, to, to develop. <laughs> ASCAP, and ASCAP was formed in 1915. Sorry, what's ASCAP? Um, uh, the music, one of the music license collection societies. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, and that what that system allowed them to then do is not only get through radio and TV and but also in the digital age have a, a whole range of different monetization strategies. Yes, they get uh, money from Google and Facebook, but it's also Spotify. Plus they have direct sales, plus they can you know, develop a whole range of, uh, uh, of products uh, around their music content. I think we're re really early into this discussion. What you see, what I've been advocating for as a sort of initial step is for news publishers to be able to collectively negotiate with the major tech platforms. Um, you know, the, the current antitrust laws protect Google and Facebook from us, interestingly. And you see similar in Europe is taking a copyright approach where, uh, where they've developed new copyrights for news and they're in the midst of asserting those. Australia is taking essentially a competition uh, approach, more of a thinking about analogy to the cable business here in the US. I think there's a lot of sort of tectonic plates moving, but we're still pretty early in the discussion about what is this monetization of textual news content look like in the century ahead? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up the antitrust angle of negotiation. Um, but the question I would have then is, to what degree is this about society and business and sort of the private sector and civil society coming to some sort of consensus outside of government. So for example, I don't know the history of sheet music, but I, I would wager that it probably wasn't the like Woodrow Wilson administration who got that association together. So as we think about this weird mix of the needs for platforms to assume responsibility for things, the needs for, for example, it's a good thing that consumers have adapted to paying for content. How do we think about this mix of government, socioculture, but also sort of top-down sort of changes? Yeah, I mean, what government has to do is set the framework to allow private solutions to happen. So the, uh, the Department of Justice issued um, antitrust waivers, essentially, for music licensing in 1941, I think mm -hmm. it was. So they essentially, they... The, you know, they set up the framework under which there could be private solutions. And by the way, for some reason, you're not hearing anybody talk about we need a government bailout of the music business, <laughs> right? Because they were able to then develop monetization models that carried them through, again, a lot of different uh, disruptions. Um, I, I think, um, you know, news has a particularly important role uh, in civic society, and I think people understand that. I mean, the line I always use is nobody's asking for congressional hearings about fake cat videos, okay? <laughs> that news and quality journalism sustains civic society in some ways that are important and that we have to uh, uh, continue. It is also, interestingly, when we talk about social media networks, quality journalism is an antidote for bad stuff out there, right? If, so, if somebody has a fake news problem, guess what? We're in the real news business. Mm -hmm. So we are, uh, it is necessary to keep the quality of information flow uh, um, uh, going uh, online. This is actually one of the reasons, and this is a little bit of a segue, but I'll bring it back, I promise. 
why you have to be careful about focusing on any one channel of monetization. Because let's say the argument's often made, it should be a 100% subscription business, right? You know, do email distribution, uh, make everything uh, like a, an email newsletter, 100% reader revenue supported. Okay, that that's a, by the way, that's a good model for s some kind of uh, content. And I am a big Substack subscriber, so I, I get all that. But we also have to understand in a 100% reader revenue world, that means some people get the information, mm -hmm. the people who can pay and do pay, and some people don't. You don't pay, you don't get. And we've gotten very used to a kind of free availability of information online, but that's that's not, you know, free is not a business model in the news business, it turns out. So uh, it's really important to try to drive as many multiple sources of revenue and support as we can. Yeah. So to that sort of point, to what degree is it possible that in the year 2020, journalism is a significant part of journalism or some functions of journalism, especially at the local level, are just simply public goods that can either be provided through the nonprofit sector or significant government subsidy. So to bring your point, there's no government bailout of the music industry. Well, that's because music isn't a public good. I'm not sure what I think. I'm just sort of responding. Sort of music isn't a public yeah. good, right? There's 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 there is never any sort of question about whether or not concerts or merchandise and the sort of broader products of music are monetizable. There is a serious question for many people about whether or not, given the challenges and the dynamic you're sort of facing, because I was gonna ask you if you're a pugilist, who are you sort of fighting? There there is there there is an argument for saying that those challenges are simply such that we should just recategorize whole sections of news and move beyond sort of these parts of the debates about the business model. What do you think about that broad dynamic? I, I think that, uh, first of all, news is valuable. So it's okay to ask that it be valued. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it doesn't, uh, the only model doesn't have to be, uh, you know, we, it, it can only be given away for free. Um, the And I think we haven't yet, uh, figured out what is this digital distribution system mean and what value should be returned back? You know, when you when you jump to the answer that uh, we should have, uh, the government should pay for everything. First of all, there are a lot of conflicts related to that. Yeah. <laughs> right? And particularly in the news business. And you're completely letting off the hook, the distributors of the content. Our primary distributors currently are Google and Facebook, but they're you're sort of letting them off the hook and saying the government's going to pay for this content, which then you can distribute and get a lot of user attention around. And I, I think we've got to figure out the value return in the digital distribution first. Um, and uh, and I believe there is a good business there that would both sustain the business, but also make it pretty freely available. And um you know, a friend of mine, I think he's uh, uh, is on this uh, call, said, you know, financial independence is its own way to viewpoint independence. Mm -hmm. If you if you care about an independent media, that also means a media that can stand up for itself financially. And I think there's a, we can get there. I don't I think taking off the table, uh, the platforms uh, shouldn't return any value. Taking all these categories off the table is hamstring ourselves when by the way, they pay for other kinds of content. We're kind of uniquely punished in a way. So this is where the European example and then sort of government becomes key, because as I understand it, and correct me if I'm getting the history here wrong, part of the issue with the approach that's sort of implicit and explicit what you're describing is that in Europe, tech platforms have simply just refused to serve news in certain respects, sort of saying, um, actually, David, it turns out that do people consume news on our platform? Yes, but we just aren't going to serve it because it's not crucial to our business model. How do you get around that sort of dynamic? Because as I understand it, the Europeans are sort of responding by sort of basically saying you can't say that. Um, so how do you how do you think about that dynamic? Yeah, I mean, the one example that's always thrown up and completely misunderstood, by the way, is uh, uh, Google uh, delisted Spanish publishers, right? And there's a dispute. 
Um, and people say that was some big disaster for Spanish publishers. Anybody who says that hasn't spoken to a Spanish publisher. I haven't. Actually. So, <laughs> I haven't lately. <laughs> what they saw actually was uh, a sort of temporary dip and then much higher traffic directly to their sites. I mean, there, it wasn't some huge disaster for Spanish publishers. But to, at a very at a much bigger macro level, you know, there are recent threats by Google and Facebook in Australia where there's a, this whole idea about negotiating the terms of digital distribution. And uh, and there was a threat that they would pull news content off the sites. First of all, a, a lot of user attention is tied to news. Think about everybody who went online last week to talk about news about the election, right? There's a uh, there is value to the platforms from this uh, from this content. Secondly, if you're somebody like Facebook and you take off all the quality journalism off their feed, then what's left? Mm -hmm. Okay, they then are subject to a world in which the antidote for fake news has been taken out of the system. So I think most of this is you know negotiating uh, posturing. We need to come to a better arrangement for monetizing our content through the digital distribution. There's different strategies for it, but we're all coming to the same conclusion because we are all better off having our content get to as many people as possible uh, and for the platforms to host quality journalism. So, I, you know, I don't get too wound up in people's uh, sort of uh, threats, if, if you will. That's great. So. I think the immediate question that would be looking at the sort of incoming Biden administration, obviously the Senate is still, you know, up for grabs to a certain degree. How do you sort of think about the legislative picture when it comes to the antitrust negotiation ability and those other issues? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of discussion right now. Or, or how is the Biden administration going to approach uh, uh, tech policy, if you will? Um, I don't know that I'm seeing evidence of some big shift, right? I think uh, if you look, there's a couple different levels. If you look at the Department of Justice antitrust case and the cases to come, and I think there will be additional cases, you know, those things are, are basically staff driven and analytically driven and uh, not really political decisions. I don't. I never viewed them as political decisions. And I don't think that uh, they get framed that way mm -hmm. because that's useful. But I think the merits are there, and they're going to continue to be there. And I fully expect a Biden administration to to continue in that vein. Um, if you look at Section Two Thirty, a really hard problem, uh, but a lot of people have a lot of complaints, different kinds of complaints. Uh, I think there will be adjustments to Section 230. We have our sets of complaints about it, in particular about how the platforms amplify. We think, and I'm happy to dig into that question, but, you know, there's a lot of focus for on what third parties do, mm -hmm. like what people post, and not enough emphasis on what the platforms do, which is decide what gets seen and what doesn't get seen. And then most specifically, we have a, a bill that would allow news publishers to collectively negotiate. Really, I, the only thing I'm asking the government to do is to leave us alone. Uh, we've had we had great support uh, in both the House and Senate. We're pushing for that bill to go forward. We have support on a bipartisan basis. You know, uh, I, David Cicilline is a primary co-sponsor in the House, and Mitch McConnell is a co-sponsor in the Senate. That's I'm a not coalition. Sure, how many bills those guys co-sponsor together? But it's not a long list. So, you know, I think. Again, this is all part of a slow movement to renegotiate the terms in a way that worked for everybody. Yeah. So as we're sort of nearing the end of this, I want to sort of leave people with a useful framework for approaching this. So if we're in agreement about the idea, given your metaphors, that there's a lot to be shaken out, um, both from a sort of what's posturing, what is serious, to the fact that there's a sort of intersectional sort of connection between government, the decision of companies and the actual individual publishers themselves. How do you sort of see, I don't want you to make any, or ask you to make specific predictions because that's difficult, but just trend wise, how do you sort of see the challenges and opportunities we're discussing sort of play themselves out over the next sort of five or six years? Yeah. If you, I, let's start with local news. Yeah. Um, 
I, I think one of the interesting things about COVID and social justice issues and other things we've dealt with this year has been almost a reattachment of people to local news and information. You know, there there was a long term trend previous to Trump, but accelerated by Trump of nationalization of news attention. Mm -hmm. Right. And what we've seen this year is the telescope got spun around 180 and all of a sudden there's a lot of focus on what's happening locally in your community. Um, I think that sustains and I think uh, there will be continue to be technical evolutions. And uh, you look at things like the challenges to local linear TV, right, in the streaming era. So where do people in the future go for their local news and information? What does that look like? It's a combination, a rich combination of text and video and audio. And I think uh, a number of my members are kind of well placed to win in that world. So I, I, I you know, again, we've, we're in mid evolution, um, but I think uh, you're going to see a lot of interesting and in innovative solutions, particularly at the local level coming up. What we have to do, if we want there to be the ability for new entrants, for startups, for uh, continuation of my current members, we need that digital distribution to make monetary sense, to return value. Uh, and if we can get a better deal there and add in reader revenue and add in events and, and retail and connecting uh, uh, local advertisers, um, I, you know, you can come up with a rich business that people care about a lot and returns a lot of value to local readers. Yeah. So as we're sort of, cl we've closed out the 2010s, obviously the journalism media industry has gone through a lot of highs and lows over this decade. As we close it out, how do you, what do you think the major takeaways are? You've already hit one with sort of not depending solely on one source of revenue, not depending on one sort of platform, but broadly speaking, as you're working with your members, how are you thinking about the takeaways of all these different transformative changes? Um, I think it's hard, right? The, I'm not, the, the industry has been hit hard financially. I think, you know, the cutbacks, but I think you have to stop for a minute and say, hey, how important are we? And not just how, how important do we tell, we tell ourselves we are, <laughs> right? It's how centered in the national discussion are we? Uh, what is the impact of our, uh, of our journalism? I mean, just look this week at how much crazy crap has been out, uh, you know, uh, distributed in the, in the, ecosystem where our journalism has been the antidote about that. No, that's not happening. No, there's, you know, here are the facts. So I think, you know, even though the financials are really constrained, the quality and importance of the product is off the charts. And that's something you can build around, right? You know, people make these stupid analogies about buggy whips industries. People didn't buy buggy whips because they didn't need them anymore. People need and want our stuff more than mm -hmm. ever. So you, so that's a place where you can build a business to, right? It's we got our issues, we got our challenges, major ones. But I'd much rather be where I am than in a lot of other spaces because people want the stuff and need it. Yeah. So I think what I've appreciated about your comments is it's a good mix of realism, but also sort of optimism. What would your sort of closing? message be for people who are once again are closing out this decade we're looking at sort of a new legislative opportunity a transition in government what would your sort of closing thoughts be for this panel um i i think it's where we started which is weirdly at the end of the day i have optimism mm -hmm. be, and i really do and this is not just because i'm paid to have optimism <laughs> yeah the source uh, matters there <laughs> although i am paid to have optimism but it's not just because of that uh Again, because you know, there's a lot of different businesses that don't matter or don't matter much to people, and we do, right? So then, so then, uh, if you take a disciplined look and back it out and figure out how do we then return value back to support that it matters, and and just because the digital ecosystem is what it is today doesn't mean that's what it has to be in the future, mm -hmm. right? And changing course. Uh, and uh, uh, and fixing things so that we can sustain the news business is not really that hard, not really that expensive and entirely achievable. So this is not some, uh, you know, uh, you know, rolling a rock up the hill. 
uh, I've got, we have the good stuff. It needs to be paid for. It can be paid for. And so let's, let's be optimistic and build around that. Great place to end. David, thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to see how y'all progress during the uh, 2021 start to everything. Excellent. Thank you very much for thank having you. me.